I'm Adrian Finnegan, and this is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, cheaper than a fighter jet, saving boots on the ground, and turning the globe into a battlefield. Drones, the multi-billion dollar industry, and the nation's changing warfare. Power for life, but what of President Putin's last two decades? We look at the economic successes and failures. Plus, the cost of a trade war and now the coronavirus. As investors grow increasingly anxious, we look at the economic impact of China's spreading virus outbreak. Unmanned aerial vehicles, or drones, have come a long way since their introduction in the first Gulf War in 1991. At the time, they were used just for surveillance and intelligence gathering. A decade later, a Predator drone fitted with a missile was used by the CIA in an attempt to kill the Taliban leader Mullah Omar. And now, almost a decade on from that failed attempt, another first, the assassination of Iran's Qasem Soleimani, the first time a senior military figure has been killed on foreign soil. Drones mean that troops don't have to be deployed into hostile territory, saving lives, but there have been many civilian casualties. Under former U.S. President Barack Obama, the number of drone strikes rose to 563 from 57 under George W. Bush. More than 800 innocent civilians were killed in Pakistan, Somalia and Yemen. Despite that, this is a growing industry. According to defence analysts, Teal Group spending on research and development and procurement is expected to rise to $14.3 billion by 2029. That's up 30% from $11.1 billion this year. The U.S. is by far the biggest spender on drones. In its 2018 budget, almost $7 billion was set aside for research and development and buying UAVs. The drone used in the killing of Soleimani costs a fraction of buying an F-35 manned aircraft. The General Atomics MQ-9 Reaper system costs $64.2 million, and you get four drones included in that price. While we're concentrating on U.S. spending, it's worth noting that much less expensive technology has been used to great effect. The United States and Saudi Arabia blamed Iran for an attack on Aramco oil fields that wiped out half the country's oil production. China makes a rival to the MQ-9 Reaper for the export market, and it's said to cost half the price of the U.S. system. The aircraft has been used by the Iraqi military in attacks on ISIS. And Turkey has become the first to attach a machine gun to a drone to protect military convoys. And that's not all. They've been flying autonomous drones that can find, track and kill. But it's not just nations like Israel, Iran and Pakistan that have used drones to target people. Non-state actors, ISIS and the PKK have used drones in attacks too. Drones you can buy from Amazon. Joining us now from London, Justin Bronk. Justin is a research fellow for air power and technology at the Royal United Services Institute for Defence and Security Studies. Justin's also the author of The Future of NATO Air Power. Good to have you with us, uh, Justin. The US spends the most, uses the most, kills the most using drones. Uh, is there any need these days to deploy conventional warplanes? Is the use of drones a shift in strategy or do they complement traditional air power? So the use of drones, uh, by which in this case I think we mean remotely piloted drones, uh, like the Predator or Reaper series that the United States uses uh, very frequently, uh, is an extremely efficient uh, way to provide both surveillance and strike options uh, over long periods of time, but only in permissive airspace, so airspace that is not contested by uh, state opponents with either surface-to-air missiles electronic warfare capabilities or their own air force. Uh, as Iran showed recently with the uh, shoot down of uh, an RQ-4 um, Global Hawk uh, just inside international waters but near Iran's borders in the Straits of Hormuz, that was one of the most sophisticated, most expensive uh, remotely flown drones in the world. Uh, it was about $230 million for each one of those. Um, and yet, as Iran showed, it can be shot down by relatively um, dated surface-to-air missile technology. So definitely uh, very much an ascendant system uh, for use in counterinsurgency conflicts where there is no state threat, 
Um, but conventional warplanes very much still required and at the forefront for state-on-state -state conflict or deterrence. All right, so who's using drones? Who's got them? Israel produced and had a fairly dominant role in the development of, of drones. Turkey appears to developing its own uh, drone capabilities at a fairly rapid pace. What's behind that? So the, the basic technology behind creating something uh, that flies uh, as a remotely flown drone with weapons capability is not t particularly challenging. Um, so we're seeing, as you say, uh, China is in fact one of the biggest exporters now of armed drones. Israel has long been uh, the leading global exporter of remotely piloted drones, but it does not and it has not so far exported armed variants, although it does use them itself. Um, Russia trying to get into the game uh, with its Orlan series and various other types, although falling a bit behind there. The United States obviously a, a leader in terms of capabilities and Turkey has uh, successfully developed quite an impressive uh, domestic drone industry. Um, what's much more complicated if you as a country want to operate them like the United States does with a sort of really global reach is that you need a satellite communications capability to uh, control those drones through a satellite uplink rather than a, a line of sight radio link from a ground station, uh, which is what uh, most, for example, users in the Middle East do. Obviously, the sort of satellite constellations and control mechanisms required are only possessed by a few countries, particularly the United States, China and Russia. Uh, so, for example, if states want to lease a Chinese drone or buy a Chinese drone with SATCOM capabilities, they'll also have to make a deal with the Chinese government to uh, utilize Chinese um, satellite constellations. All right. But, and, and who oversees the, the sale of that technology and uh, regulates how it's, it's used? I mean, is it, is it a case of, of perhaps China selling the technology and not asking too many questions? Uh, certainly, the United States has uh, had a policy of classifying uh, the export of armed drones uh, as uh, an issue under the missile technology control regime, uh, so treating them rather like cruise missiles for regulation purposes, uh, meaning that they don't sell ones with a range of beyond 500 kilometers with a payload of beyond a certain uh, amount of CNT. Um, that has been uh, to mainly to keep the technology um, and have an, a legal basis for keeping the technology to themselves uh, and sort of close allies like the United Kingdom. Um, but as China uh, has you know, aggressively expanded into the armed drone market internationally and even players like Turkey, much smaller countries are now selling, there's pressure in the US to um, withdraw those restrictions. Uh, certainly those countries that operate advanced US military hardware will know uh, there's a fair amount of training support mechanisms uh, that go with those systems uh, and those are often used to put conditions or kind of shape the way that um, export uh, customers actually can and do use those platforms. For China it's very much a case of here's the stuff it may not be quite as good as the US stuff, but however you want to use it, that's your business. Nonetheless, I mean, Chinese or, or American or whoever else, we're talking about high-end, sophisticated, expensive stuff. But drone technology these days is pretty accessible to almost everyone, isn't it? I mean, there are allegations that the PKK has bought off-the-shelf technology um, that allows you to enter GPS for coordinates uh, for targets and, and off it and off it flies like a, a like a cruise missile and if you've armed it it could do some serious damage so there's the, the word drone uh, covers an enormous number of different systems so ranging from commercial uh, sort of quadcopter you know little quadcopters or kind of model aircraft type uh, at least sized systems and a lot of armed groups uh, around the world in a lot of countries as well have been uh, marrying up those sort of little commercial airframes with uh, GPS technology and even things like facial recognition um, and sort of getting them to carry small explosive charges to act as, as um, weapon systems. Uh, they are in a different class particularly in terms of range, persistence, destructive power from those much larger remotely flown systems like the Redditor, uh, sorry, Predator, Reaper, Chinese CH4 or Wing Lung, um, which uh, offer you the opportunity to project power over hundreds of kilometers and drop weapons uh, repeatedly with sensor packages. Those are at a different level and they're, they're kind of the size of small light aircraft. 
uh, as opposed to toys. And then at, an upper, at the upper level, you have really, really big systems, which are still, technically speaking, drones, um, like the American Global Hawk, which is the size of a small airliner, um, and uh, systems perhaps designed with low radar observability, like the RQ-170. So there is a whole range. Uh, saying the word drone is a bit like saying the word aircraft. It, it covers a huge number of things. Well, very much food for thought. Uh, Justin, really good to talk to you. Many thanks indeed for being with us on Counting the Cost. My pleasure. Russia's President Vladimir Putin crushed the hopes of potential acolytes who would take over from him with plans to rewrite the Constitution to beef up the power of Parliament, allowing him to grab power after he steps down. In power for more than 20 years, he could extend his ability to rule indefinitely. I think that for Russia, with its vast territory, numerous confessions and a multitude of peoples and ethnic groups, I can't even count the number of groups. Some say it's 160, others claim 190. Russia needs a strong presidential power. But what of his economic record has he delivered for the Russian people? Well... Take a look at this. We have two data points here, GDP, the Manhattan-style blocks here, and unemployment, the white line. Let's start before he took power in 2000. 1998 marked a low for the nation as the economy collapsed under President Yeltsin. The real impact, though, felt in 1999. Unemployment at 12.5% and the economy just $195 billion. Now, Putin introduced economic reforms and a boom in oil prices meant the country felt richer. By 2008, unemployment had halved and the economy had shot up to $1.6 trillion. That all came crashing down, though, with more than $400 billion wiped off the value of the economy after the North Atlantic financial crisis. Again, the impact was felt a year later in 2009. Unemployment now at 8% the economy worth $1.2 trillion. Now, the annexation of Crimea and the conflict in eastern Ukraine saw sanctions cripple the economy after rising in value to $2.2 trillion. It shrank to $1.2 trillion. At the end of 2018, though, the economy is becoming more resilient to sanctions. It's worth almost $1.7 trillion, and employment at a respectable 4.8%. Joining us now from our London studio, Charles Robertson. Charles is the global chief economist at Russian bank Renaissance Capital. Charles is also the lead author of The Fastest Billion. Good to have you with us uh, again, uh, Charles. Before we get into the nitty-gritty, give us a broad overview. How is Russia's economy doing under Putin's tenure? Well, he did an incredible job in the first decade or so, um, helped by rising oil prices. Um, when he inherited power, Russia was the same size as Belgium um, as an economy, and very rapidly it became the size of the Netherlands and then became even bigger. It's a top ten economy now with low inflation, decent enough growth, um, but people often forget about Russian demographics and, and forget to kind of strip out the population growth numbers. So actually it's doing not that differently from China um, on a per capita basis for GDP at the moment, um, or, or India for that matter. So it's, it's doing a pretty decent job, um, but the headline numbers, what, we think 2.5% growth this year. Uh, it's not super exciting for, for some investors, but it's actually very good by emerging market standards. He has had a, a tendency, though, to, to shoot himself in the foot somewhat with um, the annexation of Crimea, uh, and then there's involvement in Ukraine and the sanctions that have been imposed uh, against Russia because of, of that. That's self-inflicted pain, isn't it? Well, it's, he's got this thing where he's determined to make Russia the most respons well, fiscally responsible, most stable economy he possibly can. And he's done things that I think very few leaders around the world have done. So their external debt is smaller than their reserves. Um, their public debt to, to revenues, to tax revenues ratios, the lowest in emerging markets. So he's made it very, very safe. Um, and it's a very competitive uh, economy in terms of the minimum wage, which is now less than China. Uh, you can pay people $180 a month in Russia, but the education levels in Russia are still better on average than in China. Um, but people are not putting their supply chains, they're not putting their foreign direct investment into Russia to build factories there, even though the wages are cheap and the education level is good and the economy is very stable, they're not doing that because of this fear of sanctions. And I think the fact that if you set up a factory and you want to take a five, ten year view on a country, 
you need a bit more uh, reassurance about that potential geopolitical risk. Um, and, and Russia, unfortunately, for the last few years, hasn't been able to provide that reassurance. You talk about that low minimum wage, something like 13.2% is the, is the poverty level in, in Russia. I mean, that's not bad compared to, to some parts of Europe. But, but how is he going to get that, that figure down? Does that involve in, in stimulus funding and perhaps this $100 billion rainy day fund that, that, that he's got? Yeah, he's, they've built up an awful lot of reserves. So his first priority was stability. And his second view was that to, well, to at least not hurt the poorest in society, you need to get inflation down. And that's been a big priority for the last few years. So there was actually budget uh, tightening uh, in 2018, and it still ran through into 2019 as they tried to make sure their budget was as close to balance as possible. Uh, so VAT went up, uh, and that does hurt the poorest. Um, I, th I think they're... One of the things that's going to help them is the demographics. So at the moment, the number of young people is nearly halved in 10 years. So the number of 15 to 24-year-olds is down from about 12 million to about six and a half, seven million. So there's many, many less, uh, much smaller pool of young Russians to be footballers or models or entrepreneurs or whatever. But these people are not coming into the workforce. So the consequence is that unemployment's very, very low. And I think their hope is that, that given the workforce is actually shrinking now, um, unemployment's already low, wages should pick up, uh, and that should help on the poverty side. Uh, he wants to invest, what, $400 billion on infrastructure projects. I mean, what's delaying that? I mean, he is doing things like, like building new pipelines, diversifying new customers like, like China, this, this pipeline that's going via Turkey to avoid Ukraine. He's, he's definitely trying to make the economy more resilient. He is. Um, so they've diversified where they're exporting energy to, uh, and the pipeline to, to China is up and running, and that's all been financed by, by companies like Gazprom. Um, what's the, the shift that's happened in the last 12 months is, is to say, OK, we've now got these $600 billion of, of reserves, including this, this large uh, national kind of these national funds that have been built up. Let's try and spend a bit of that to get the economy growing a bit faster, because last year it was about 1% growth, 2019. Um, how can we get it a bit faster? And, and they are now saying we have enough spare cash to, to, to spend. There's been a resistance on the part of some of the te technocrats in Russia who've said, can we be sure this money will be spent wisely? Can we be sure it won't be uh, diverted into corrupt kind of schemes? Um, so he's just done a cabinet reshuffle uh, a couple of weeks ago, and that is about trying to get people in who will push forward this spending. It was supposed to start last year didn't really get going until the end of last year. We think it's going to lift growth to two and a half this year. But it does, uh, so we think it's going to start to come through. It, it, it doesn't matter how much Go. you spend, though. Uh, it, it, that's not going to solve the problem of the ageing population, uh, uh, as you said. I mean, how, how does he tackle that one? It, there's, well, there's, there's all the, the encouragement of, of mothers to have babies and kind of the tax breaks and child benefit support. And you're seeing that not just in Russia, you're seeing it in uh, Hungary. And I found out the other day in Abu Dhabi as well, uh, they're trying to encourage uh, people to have more children. Um, that's a, like a 10, 20 year story. Uh, it's not something you can do a great deal about. We did a big chunk of work on demographics, though. Um, and it said that uh, Russia's uh, ratio of adults to pensioners and kids right now, it should be growing at 3%. Um, so it's actually been underperforming for a few years since the oil price crashed. Um, but it should be growing at 3 And if he gets all the policies right, you can beat that, that average of what countries do with this ratio. Um, you could beat 3 You could even be getting 4 in a really good scenario. Interestingly, very few people think you're going to get 4 um, three, even three is seen as, as quite optimistic by most people in the market. Charles, always great to talk to you. Many thanks indeed for being with us on Counting the Cost. Now, the death toll from the coronavirus outbreak in China keeps rising. The government has extended the Lunar New Year holiday and businesses have shut down to try to curb the spread. A total of 18 cities in central Hubei province now have some sort of travel restrictions affecting some 56 million people. Authorities are rushing to build a hospital to accommodate a thousand beds to treat the victims. Just when the Chinese authorities hoped the economy would begin to pick up, after signing a phase one trade deal with the United States, it's already having to count the cost of yet another outbreak following the SARS crisis a decade ago. Now, the likelihood of the virus disrupting global businesses and China as the world's second largest economy 
appears to be growing. Rob McBride reports now on the growing economic impact. As China reels from the impact of the virus, some of the worst predictions suggest that economic growth could slow by as much as four percentage points in this first quarter. Transport connections have been brought to a standstill. Theme parks and cinemas are closed, with hotels, restaurants and stores all taking big losses. For neighboring Hong Kong, already in recession after months of anti-government protests, the virus has delivered what might be described as the perfect economic storm. The gloom has been reflected in stock markets reopening after the Lunar New Year break. In South Korea, ministers held an emergency meeting to discuss not only the health implications of the virus, but its impact on the economic health of the country. The government will make all-out efforts to safeguard citizens' safety and minimize impact on the economy as long as this new infection poses a threat. Comparisons have been made with the SARS virus in 2003 that had far-reaching economic impact beyond China. The difference between then and now is the size of the Chinese economy and its relationship with the global economy. More trade, more travel, China is so much more interconnected with the rest of the world that 17 years on, damage to its economy is so much more consequential. And today the world economy is more vulnerable, facing a global downturn as it did in 2003. Generally, global economy was, was very bad. And, and, and that has affected Korea, that has affected uh, also uh, China. Uh, now the situation is uh, a little similar in the sense that, you know, glo global economies tend to come down after a boom in 2017, 2018. What's different, it seems, is the way China has learned from past epidemics. Scientifically, institutionally, uh, I think China is more prepared to to control the, this kind of epidemic. China's success, or otherwise, will have far-reaching economic consequences for all its neighbors. Let's bring in our guests. Joining us from London, Patrick Perrett Green. Patrick is the head of global macroeconomic strategy at Ad Macro. Good to have you with us, uh, Patrick. I know the infection rate hasn't yet peaked yet, but what's going to be the likely impact on China's economy, China's internal economy and the wider region? Well, I think we're, we're only just beginning to appreciate um, the wider effects. Um, we're talking about unprecedented action, the major cities being shut down, business enterprises being closed till at least February the 9th. And we're talking about the, a lot of the bit more prosperous, more dynamic cities like Shanghai, Guangzhou, etc. And I think personally, this is going to take at least one, you know, China's growth for the year will be down at least 1%. But then you've got to think about all the countries that are so dependent on China, such as Korea, where exports to China are about 15% of GDP. Australia has a very high exposure. Japan, even the EU has $25 billion of exports to China every month. I think exports can easily fall by 20% in the short term. And Chinese tourism is another area where we're going to see a major, major collapse because Chinese consumer confidence is not going to come back from this very quickly. One percent, that's a, that's a whopping amount. I mean, how does that compare to the, the SARS epidemic back in 2003? Well, I think this is where a lot of people have been making mistakes. They're trying to talk about the experience of SARS, but the obvious thing is that from an economic perspective, China in 2003 was a, was a small economy. It was a one and a half trillion dollar economy with a four percent share of G, global GDP. Now, it is a 14 trillion giant, 16% of one sixth of global GDP. Um, and not only that, the, the Chinese consumer is really the, 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 the sort of determining consumer in terms of global demand. I mean, they're the ones whose consumer demand has been hit. And I think it's, and also they're taking, they're, they're responsible for an increasing share of Chinese growths. So it's, um, it's, it's, I think when people are trying to compare SARS to now, it's actually a pointless exercise. And this all comes back to the man at the top. Uh, what does it tell us about President Xi's leadership? Well, I think this is one of the problems that China has, is facing. This is a long-term problem. Um, we've called it the Stalinization of Chairman Xi. As you concentrate power 
um, and it's, it's, he has an unprecedented amount of power compared to any Chinese leader, probably even greater than, than Mao, because he is a micromanager as well. And, and what that breeds is a, 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 with an increasingly authoritarian environment, is a, is a sort of culture of fear. No one wants, no one wants to raise a problem. Uh, there's a sort of, sh uh, there's a general paranoia about shoot the messenger. Um, his, I mean, one of the reasons he has consolidated power, and it's something we've been telling people for a, num for a fair, fair period of time now, is that the consolidation of power is actually a preparation for, the ty for times that the Chinese economy will not do so well. Patrick, really good to talk to you on Counting the Cost. Many thanks indeed. My pleasure. And that's our show for this week. If you'd like to comment on anything that you've seen, you can get in touch with me. I'm at A. Finnegan on Twitter. Please use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or you can drop us a line. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our email address. As always, there's plenty more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That takes you straight to our page. And there you'll find individual reports, links, even entire episodes for you to catch up on. But that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Adrian Finnegan from the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for being with us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>